Good morning and welcome to worship, the last and fifth Sunday in August. Oh, we missed the, the have, have you ever been a part of a church that every time there's a fifth Sunday they do a hymn scene? Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's like, no? Nah. Anyway, some churches I've been at do that and they, uh, and when there's five Sundays in a month and they'll just sing songs all day. I'm getting a message that perhaps I might want to pull this down. So I'll keep my distance and thank you for wearing your mask and keeping distance so that everybody can stay safe in here. Um, we continue to wrestle with the coronavirus and all that comes with that. If you are joining us at home, we do welcome you, and we're glad that you're able to, to make that connection, whether you're at home because of coronavirus or, or some other reason. It is good that we are together 
at a distance. And so we encourage you to have elements for communion, and if you have a candle handy, go ahead and light that so you can have the light of Christ in, in your presence and participate in our worship fully. And for those of you who may be visiting, you're welcome to participate in our worship um, to the extent you're, that you are comfortable. If there's some language within the, the liturgy that, that you have different words you like to use, go ahead and do that. That is perfectly acceptable. Um, and our communion elements are the little bread wafers and grape juice. And if, if you need a gluten-free version of the bread, we do have those available. All of our communion elements are just as you come in the, the door there in little trays, and there's a bread with the juice stacked on top of it, and so you can get those. And so if you didn't get an opportunity to, to have one of those, you can grab that during our opening hymn. Um, we are still trying from our evangelism team to, to get together a little bit of a sharing what this congregation is about. And so if you have um, can come up with a thought as to why you love this church, they would love it if you would write down a, a little synopsis of why you love this church. They would love it even more if you did a video explaining that um, verbally. And if you would like me to record the video for you so you don't have to worry about anything other than talking, then I'm more than happy to, to meet you somewhere and we can record that video. One of the things that happened over the past week is we had a conversation about um, what we might do for ministry with, with youth, children, and, and families. And we're kind of in a place where we're not quite sure how we move forward. Do, is now the right time? And what we came up with is, is for now and for the first time, we want to have a game night and do that outside. And so I have to get my bearings. The field's over there, isn't it? So outside over there, um, and we need some people to help organize that. If you have some good outdoor games and, and you might want to contribute to the, the ideas and help get the word out, let the office know. And as soon as we have a, a group of people that are willing to help organize that, then we'll set a date and find out sort of if we want to just have it a free-for-all or if we come up with some kind of theme. We're not quite sure what it'll look like, but we do know that it would be um, a, a good fun event that we can do outside and, and weather permitting, everybody can, can keep pretty safe. So that's sort of our plan at this point. Any other announcements that need to be lifted up? We had our congregational meeting last week. The board, um, not the board, but the bylaws were revised and passed, and we had a, a little bit of a, a confirmation of, of approved spending for some repair work that needs to happen to keep our facilities in good shape. And so that all went pretty well. I think that's, yeah. All right. So that is on here somewhere. I'm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Flowers are given of, to the glory of God by Becky Abel in remembrance and celebration of Bob Williams's passing and his and his life. Oh, just not just to you, yeah. So the the whole family. All right, so we will join in our call to worship. And so, Floyd, I turn it over to you for that. Enter into this time of worship with expectant hearts. Expect to be accepted as you are. Expect it to be okay to be authentically you. Expect to be comforted and challenged at the same time. Expect to be transformed, yet remain the same. Then let us continue in worship with expectant hearts. Let us sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let us take a moment of silence to reflect and invite the Holy Spirit in. Father, we thank you for creating all, for being our church, and for this moment of time, for this very second, to be here with you and to worship you. We know that you blessed us with leadership, blessed us with music, and have given Pastor Stephen thoughts and words to feed us. Thank you, Father. We ask for your guidance and to open our hearts and our minds right now as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. those Tuesday guys eating donuts and it's been my experience that there are usually extras just a one or two extras at the end of their their work day which means that there's probably room for a couple of extra people to come in and help out and it, it, they call it Tuesday guys but I don't think you have to identify as male to, to participate so um, if, you, if you're looking for something to do on a Tuesday then I'm sure they'd love to have your your uh, company so just want to offer up anybody wants to hear a little story out of the Spark Story Bible, they're welcome to come forward, but don't feel obligated. So. That's all right. We'll go on with our choir piece. <clears throat> you don't have to, but it's good to see you. We have to find the right page again. Yeah. There it is. So this is the Spark Story Bible. It ends the Spark Story Bible. There's all kinds of, uh, we'll get to that. Um, there's all kinds of stories, and this is Squiggles the Caterpillar. Squiggles the Caterpillar is on every page. And so... Here, he looks like he's having a pretty good day walking along. Um, here, he's like, oh, well, what's going on in there? And here, he, oh, he looks a little bit surprised. So we've got squiggles with a look of uncertainty on his face. So we'll see what the story is all about. It's called The Disciples. Jesus told everyone he met, repent, stop the bad things you're doing and start doing good. One day, Jesus was at the seashore, and a crowd gathered to listen to hear what he had to say. Jesus hopped onto a fishing boat so more people could see and hear him. Thanks for letting me use your boat, Jesus said. Then he said to the fishing brothers, Simon and Andrew, I think that's them there, I want to thank you with lots of fish. Throw out your nets. Well, we'll try, they sighed. 
Simon and Andrew put their nets into the water. But we fished all night and caught absolutely nothing. They explained to Jesus. Now, suddenly, they felt their nets tug. They were overflowing with fish. Rip, pop, snap. The nets were so full that they were breaking. The brothers pulled in so many fish that their boat started to sink. That might be why Squiggle's eyes are so big. He's like, oh my gosh, we're going to get wet. Help, they called to their friends in another boat. We have too many fish. James and John rushed to the rescue. The weight of the fish almost took their boat under too. That's a lot of fish. You guys ever go fishing? Did you ever catch so many that it almost sank your boat? No. I've only been fishing in a boat a couple of times. I like standing on the shore. That's where I'm most comfortable. All right. They know that their new friend, they knew that their new friend Jesus must be someone special. He was the one who told them to catch this fish. Hey, Simon and Andrew. Hey, James and John. Follow me, Jesus called to them. Let's catch people instead of fish. Splash. The two sets of brothers dropped their nets into the sea. They were not fishermen anymore. Now they were disciples. Now they would follow Jesus. There they all are. Squiggles is already with Jesus. All right. Jesus met a tax collector at his office. Hey, Matthew, follow me, Jesus called. Let's collect people instead of money. Do you know what a tax collector is? That's somebody that goes around and, uh, well, they used to. Now they send it to them. But they, they'll, they'll, we pay taxes so that they can build roads and, and schools and things like that. Um, and so they collect the money and, and give it to the people who spend it. So that's a tax collector. So let's collect people instead of money. See what he did there? Instead of collecting money, collect people. Yeah. Clink, Matthew the tax collector, dropped his coins to the ground. He was not a tax collector anymore. Now he was a disciple. Now he would follow Jesus. All right, followers of Jesus. Well, that's a lot of names in there, isn't it? There's more. Jesus met seven others that day, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and other James. There's more than one James in there. Thaddeus and another Simon and Judas. Follow me, Jesus said to each of them. Crash, boing, boom. They all stopped and dropped what they were doing. Now they were disciples. Now they would follow Jesus. Jesus and his 12 friends, the disciples, shared the workload with many other followers, including Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. No matter where Jesus went, he called, um, where, where he went, Jesus called for men and women, boys and girls, to drop what they were doing and follow him. Even the sheep. Bah. Yeah, look at all of them. That's a lot of people following Jesus. Young people, old people. People with lots of hair, people with no hair, people covering their hair up. Wow. Well, that's somebody drew all those pictures. They imagined what they looked like. I don't think they really look like that. Do you think they look like that? Yeah. They might have. But we've got this page here. <clears throat> you guys can have those. There's some extras if you want to do a do-over or something. So you can color all those in. I like to color in the, all the words if that's just something that I like to do while I'm listening to someone talk. Um, and then on the inside, it says, can you draw a picture of the disciples? What do you think they looked like? And then they've got all their names in there. And so you can try and, you know, make up some, some pictures as to what they might have looked like. All right. <clears throat> well, should we have a prayer? Do you guys have any, any prayer requests? Okay, I'll come up with some. Gracious God, we give thanks for these teachings, and we ask uh, safe travels on this family as they, they head out, and we give thanks for Jesus, who we can follow so that we may know how to live good lives. In your name we pray, amen. And so I've got some markers there in that front pew, and you guys are welcome to use some of those. Just put them back here when you're done. Those are our sanctuary.
We've transitioned to the gospel according to Mark. This is our first week in Mark, right? We had, had the Kings last week. So we're moving on to the New Testament. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft. Murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the good news for God's people. I went to see my grandpa this weekend, and yesterday on my way back home, I was traveling on Highway 60, the preferred route, and... If you've been out there east of town, there's this little section where they're doing some road construction. It's down to one lane, and they've got a stoplight on each end, and you have to stop and wait your turn and go along. So as I was coming, I was the, there was nobody in front of me, and right as I got close to the light, it turned red. So I come up to a stop, and nothing's coming. But eventually, this, this truck pulls out. It took me a while to get going, and it was a big semi-truck. And so he is coming down. There were no workers on that day, so apparently it was... Um, you know, go as fast as you want day in the work zone. And, and that truck came and I was like, you know, he's going really fast. And if I didn't know that he was going to, you know, swerve over and take the, the, the open lane whenever it gets there, I would be a little bit nervous right now. I might have been a little bit nervous anyway. But he came on, he kept getting faster and faster and faster. And he comes around, whips around, and the trailer is kind of leaning over. And as he passes by, it's like the ground was shaking, and I could just feel it. It's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, there's nobody behind him. He was the only one on the road. And just as this other car pulls out into the lane, which I thought, man, that's kind of a, a long time, um, the light turns green. But they had just started on that one-lane stretch, and so I decided I better wait. I don't want to, you know, have a, a little, little bump down at the, the middle of the road. So I wait, and this person was in no hurry at all, unlike the truck. And so they just kept going and poking along. And so I'm waiting and waiting, and it's like, I'm going to miss my light. And so I'm waiting and waiting, and my light is still green. And just as they're almost there, it's almost like they were slowing down as they were getting closer. And, and so I... You know, I made the choice not to wave at them, and, um, but I did want them to let them know that you know, I do have the right of way here. So I started to sort of creep forward just a little bit to let them know, you know yeah, I'm, I'm waiting on you. And right as they transitioned over into the other lane and I could go, I start, and the light turned red. So I missed it. And so I was like, well, what do I do? Do I just go ahead and, and push through? And I knew that somebody else would probably be in the same situation as me on the other side, so I just stopped and I waited. And I had pulled forward far enough that the light was out of my, my field of view. So I was doing this, looking out my window, trying to see that the light was, was ever going to turn green. took forever. Fortunately, the people behind me were very patient. They, they saw it all happen just like I did. And, and we all had to wait together. Now, every once in a while, um, I decide that the light doesn't really pertain to me. And, and I will... Um, 
do what I want. So we've got a picture here. And this is the light that I go through most often, but not the, not the traffic light, the walk light on the side. So oftentimes during the, the mornings, I'll take a walk down to the end of Highland. Is it, no, it's not Highland, Hillcrest. So I'll walk through the botanical garden and walk down to the end of Hillcrest. There's this nice little field out there and it changes every time I'm down there. So it's an interesting experience. And then I'll come back. But I jaywalk sometimes and I will also cross not paying attention to whether it says walk or don't walk. And most of the time I do that, one, because I, I cross in the middle of the street up the street so I can keep in the shade because on this side of the street I've got shade here and then further and there's no sidewalk or crosswalk, so I just go ahead and I'll walk across if there's no traffic coming. I don't make anybody slow down for me or, or have any close calls. But then if it's like this and we've got traffic in the middle of the road, then I'll probably push that little button wait for the light to change and everybody stops and then I'll go across. But most of the time there's not a lot of traffic and so I really don't feel too bad about crossing the street when, um, when there's nobody that's gonna, gonna, I'm gonna get in their way. And really I feel better about not pushing the button because I know that the people who are coming along aren't gonna have to stop for a red light and wait just because you know, it took me 10 seconds to walk across the street but the light's gonna be red for 30 or 40. But there are times in which I do sort of obey what's going on there, and that's when this car is driving by. <laughs> that's the Ponca City Police. And I figure if I, if I you know, get in trouble someday for, for crossing the street without you know, waiting for the walk sign or not gonna, then they all, I'll plead my case, and if they, if they agree with my logic, then fine, if they don't, I'll end up paying a fine, and, and that's just, that's the way it works, right? I'll, I'll go with the, the consequences. And so what I'm dealing here with is a, um, a couple of options of how we look at our ethics. Do we follow the rules, no matter what the rules say, that's what you do, or do we take the, the context in which we're living and decide, oh, I'm gonna see what the consequence is, and make my decision based on that, regardless of what the rules are. So if you're a rule follower, if you're somebody that says, well, it doesn't matter if I go ahead and, and cross the street um, w you know, when, when it's convenient, I need to wait for the light. If, it says, if it's white and says walk, then I go. If it's red and says don't walk, I don't. If that's the person you are, then you are a deontologist. Those, that's the... The, where, where the rules matter, we follow the rules, we've all decided what the rules are, we're gonna follow them, they're there for a reason. Keep society orderly. But if you're kinda like, well, it really depends on what, what the end result is gonna be, more than it depends on the rule, then you'd be a teleologist. And so we've got deontology and teleology in this, in this understanding of, of ethics. And I have to admit, I really do fall more in that teleological realm in which I kind of look at the situation and I look at what the end result is gonna be and I make a judgment call on that. And sometimes I walk against the light. But most of the time, you know, because let's, let's admit, most of the time the rules are there for a reason and it just it makes sense to follow them. Um, sometimes people are real sticklers for the rules. The Pharisees were sticklers for the rules. They were experts in the law. They knew the, the law of Moses forward and backward, and they knew the tradition of the prophets very well. They were very great, you know, academic people that, that really studied everything, and they knew what the appropriate rule was and the course of action was for every context. And they sit here, and they see Jesus there with his disciples, and they're eating, and they're like, defiled hands, come on, you gotta wash those things. Don't you know the rules? We've got the rules for a reason. And Jesus gets into a little bit of a, a conversation about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Now the Pharisees, they really are, um, they're not the, the ruling class by any means. They're not the, the ones in charge or everything, but they are educated. They are people of, of uh, note. And 
when you compare that to the disciples, who are they? they you know, they're fishermen. They were tax collectors. Tax collectors, nobody liked the tax collectors. They were taking money for the Romans and, and the occupiers of the land. And so they saw the, the disciples as kind of dirty people, unclean people. And whether that be like um, physically or ritually, which really they were more concerned with the ritual aspect of it than, than probably the, the uh, physical aspect of it. And that's what Jesus is kind of getting at. It's like, well, where are your priorities? Where are your priorities? And so the Pharisees feel as though if you do something that is offensive to God, which eating with unclean hands would be offensive to God, then God will turn away from you. And it wasn't just that person, it was the community. Remember, they have a much more communal identity we kind of think of ourselves oftentimes as individual people of faith, and we come together as a community and worship together, and we, we do things as church, but we kind of oftentimes see our actions and our consequences of our actions as being very individualistic. They are much more community-minded, and so they felt as though if any of the people in the community were eating with defiled hands, it's just as well that everybody in the community eats with defiled hands because God would... would react to them as a whole. And so if the disciples are eating with defiled hands, everybody there is going to experience the break in relationship with the divine. And so that is their concern. I find this um, interesting that, you know, we, we kind of have this, this back and forth with the um, what's clean, what's not clean, and, and when we read these scriptures, we kind of have this impression that everybody's following these laws of, of holiness code, right? The holiness code, the cleanliness laws. Every, we, we just assume that, that that's the kind of the way that everybody is living and that these disciples were not, would have been the exception. But really, I don't know that that's the case. We have to remember that around the Sea of Galilee, there weren't a lot of Jewish people. There weren't no Jewish people, but it wasn't, it wasn't all Jewish people. Around a third of the people there were Jewish people. There were all the people that used to live there before the, the Israelites came along, and so they're still around with their traditions, and they're occupied by Rome. Remember this. They've been in, living in this, what we call a Hellenized society. The, the Romans looked to the Greeks for their inspiration of their philosophy, of their way of life, and so they really were more in line in their day-to-day -day lives with living like a, a person from the Roman Empire than they were identifying as, as people living according to the, the Jewish tradition. Now, there was probably some mix of each of those, and, and it's hard for us to really say one way or another who, what anybody was doing, but it's fairly likely, not certain, but fairly likely that Jesus and his disciples had short hair and clean-shaven faces, which is really outside of our romanticized image of all of them, according to those Renaissance paintings that we've all been experiencing um, from our upbringing that really were the, the idealized image from the European perspective. I think in our scripture today, uh, you can't see it, but this part where it says, you know, they were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. And then they've got this little parentheses for the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. Why would Mark put that in there? Doesn't everybody know this already? Actually, Mark is in a town southwest of, of the city of Rome when he's, when he's writing this, and he's understood to be a student of Peter. So he wasn't in that original group of disciples that was, was going around, but Peter's in, in this community southwest of Rome, and Mark is observing and, and hearing the stories that, that Peter is teaching about the ministry of, of Jesus. And so Mark is writing to a group of Gentiles, and he's explaining that, that uh, Jewish tradition 
as best he can, and he gets some of the details wrong, but he gets, does the best he can to explain the tradition of the Jews so that the people who are reading this text might understand exactly why the Pharisees would care if they had washed their hands or not. And so we have this um, sort of removed understanding of of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark from, and more importantly, the tradition of the Jewish people. In the early church, there was the trend for people outside of the Jewish faith to hear the stories of Jesus, to hear this amazing teacher, to, heal, to hear this healer who was offering something new. And they called it the way. And so we had all these people who weren't familiar with the Jewish tradition, but wanted to know about Jesus, the Christ, the one, the, the anointed one, the Messiah. And so in that early church, the leaders that were from that Jewish tradition had to make a decision. Well, we've got all these people coming in from the outside. Do we allow them to come and participate in this new way? Or do we make them sort of go back and, and become Jewish first so that they might more fully embrace the gospel message? Do they have to adhere to these holiness codes that we have, these cleanliness um, laws? Do they have to avoid eating the foods that we avoid eating? Where do we, where do we, where do we land on this? And so Peter, the person who was Mark's teacher, if you recall in the book of Acts, has the dream. The, the, he's in his time of meditation and prayer. And so he has this experience where he's up on the rooftop and he has this vision of a sheet coming down and it's filled with food. And he hears the words, eat. But these foods are not foods that are allowed. They're unclean foods. He says, never. I would not eat that profane food. And God responds, do not call profane what I have made clean. Eat. So this happens a couple of times. There's repetition in this. It has to, has to be duplicated to sink in for, for Peter. And he recognizes that it's okay for people to let go of some of that old tradition as we enter into this new tradition. And so that Mark is writing this piece for the Gentiles to let them know that you don't have to worry about whether or not your hands are clean ritualistically in order to participate in our group. Jesus is more concerned about what you are, how you're living and what you're producing in your actions than these rituals of the past. Now, well after Jesus' time, about 40 years after the resurrection, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple, and they killed all the priests, and they destroyed the hierarchy of the church. The priests were the ones who used to tell people what was and was not okay when it came to what's clean and unclean. The priests were the ones who kept everybody on track with these rules and regulations. And so in that vacuum of, of authority, the Pharisees were kind of the, the next in line for knowing what was right and what was not right for the people. And we'll find a lot of mention of the Pharisees, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. But Mark has a little bit about the Pharisees as well. And so they are that main remnant of the tradition, and they're a competition for this new way, this way of Jesus in which we have a new understanding of what it is to be people of faith, to be people who are holy. And so how do they know what's right and what's wrong? Jesus says, you know what's right and what's wrong based on your actions. 
what comes out of your heart, not what is going into your mouth. It is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Not from without, but from within. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. These are the roots of actions that are not pleasing in the sight of God. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. I had to look up a couple of those words. They're not common in my everyday usage. But they're all similar in that they, they predominantly come out of selfish emotion. They're ways in which we try and fulfill needs in our lives where we have emptiness. We may have some injury in the past. We have, may have some, some um, perceived inadequacy, something that we don't feel good about ourselves in, and so we try and fill that with some of these activities, which oftentimes include the exploitation or the use of another person. Not beneficial for the community. Only beneficial to feed your your self-comfort and probably doesn't do so effectively. We're in the realm of Greek philosophy a little bit with this because it, that, that notion that anything of the body, pleasure, is unholy comes from that Greek philosophy. The Stoics, who they figured if anything was divine, it was out of this world, so all things of this world must be um, unholy. And so they would abstain from the physical pleasures. And that is not what Jesus is implying here. He's not saying that emotion is bad or pleasure is bad. It's when you seek out selfish gain at the expense of others or your community. That is harmful. In our scriptures, there are generally three different types of love that are described using the words eros, philios, and agape. Now, eros and philios are, um, they're emotional. They are ways we feel about other people. The eros is the romantic love when we, we find somebody that we're just head over heels about and we have all these, these emotions of, of longing and connection that go with that. That's romance. And it's not something you can really choose. Like, oh, I think I'm going to fall in love with so-and-so. It doesn't work that way. It just kind of happens. Philios is similar, but it's it's we have a common experience. We have a common um, ground to stand on, and we like the same things. We, that's what, it's that sort of brotherly love or familial love. And so we have something that holds us together, common ground, and that is the bond of, of philios. Once again, not something you can necessarily decide that you're going to love a person in that way. It just happens out of circumstance. But agape is not an emotional type of love. Agape is a decision to act in a loving way, to act in a way that supports those around you. So it may or may not be beneficial to you. Sometimes it's an act that will come um, with a bit of, of a cost to you, but in agape, you make the conscious decision to act in love, and there's no emotion in it. No emotion required in it. There may be emotion in it, but there's no emotion required for it. And you don't have to actually like somebody to love them in that way. But you make the conscious decision that you are going to 
give of yourself and move forward with actions that are lifting up the community, lifting up the other. And that is the difference in love that comes out of um, the, the teachings of Christ versus these other examples, which some people will call love, but which really are detrimental to the welfare of others. So how will you choose to love? Not the romance, not the friendliness, but the conscious decision to make an action in your life that benefits your community, that benefits the well-being of all people. Those decisions which come from within. So in our time of reflection, I invite you to think about what it is the scripture has offered you, what it is you're going to offer back in response to the word of God. If you feel moved to make a confession of faith, to proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, accept him as the son of the living God, I invite you to come forward during this time of reflection. If you would like to express interest in membership of this church, if you have been attending here long enough that you know this is the place where you want to, to claim membership, or if you would like to express interest in baptism, I am more than happy to talk with you about that. So come forward for a confession if you would like to do so at this time. O oh, gracious God, for all of those who find themselves suddenly without their loved ones in these times of, of death and destruction, we pray that your healing spirit may be with them to comfort them, 
that their community may surround them and offer them the embrace of kindness. For all those who find themselves torn from their homes, we pray that they may find a new land in which they may feel welcomed, safe, and secure, and that the healing from their experiences of trauma may come to them, and that they know your love, and that they know your love through your children here in this world that offer a way forward through reconciliation, through peace, through healing. Our hearts go out to all those who have lost loved ones through the horrible acts in Afghanistan. Those who have lost their homes and communities to wildfires. To the people who were flooded in Tennessee and to those on the Gulf Coast who anticipate the arrival of a hurricane on the anniversary of Hurricane, hurricane Katrina, where they have suffered so much in the past, we pray that that type of devastation never reaches them again. But we give thanks because we know that where there is hardship, where there is chaos and, and uncertainty, your church will be there to help in the process of putting lives back together. We pray that we may do what we can from this place through our prayers, through our actions, to support those around the world who have dedicated their lives to bringing healing and health and peace to all those in need. And we pray that we may do what we can in this community to offer a way forward that our children feel safe and secure, that our elderly do not feel as though they have been overlooked and forgotten, and all of those in the ages between do not feel as though the burden is too great. That if we all come together and share in the work and offer each other the time and kindness to be with one another. Even the difficult times are bearable. We pray that we may, as a community of faith, continue to grow closer to you through your word, through the scriptures, and through the traditions which have been handed down to us throughout the ages. We give thanks for your son Christ. Amen. have the reminder of all that came into this world through the teachings of Christ and through his example of the lengths to which he was willing to go in order to show us the type of love which was giving of oneself to the end so that you and I might have reconciliation to our Creator. So all people are welcome at this table, whether you're a member of this congregation or not. If you have a desire to be in relationship with God through Christ Jesus, then this table has been prepared for you. The invitation comes not from me, but from Christ. So prepare our hearts for this service of communion as we sing, Fairest Lord Jesus.
Moses must have felt small and powerless in the face of God's instructions to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. Yet God moved Moses to courage and great things because Moses trusted God with his life. When we share what we have and trust God with our lives, great things will happen here in our church and far beyond these walls. The offering plate is at the back of the church where you can give electronically through GiveLify or through the church office. Please stand for the doxology. Father, we have gathered our gifts together and offered them to you in humbleness and gratitude and praise. We ask for your blessings. God, here at this table, we are reminded of Jesus and his love and his teachings. We thank you for this bread and cup, reminders of all that Jesus gave. Father, we ask for your blessings on this table as we remember, change us from within, so that what flows out is the image of God you put there. God, please let our words and actions reflect your grace and love in our world that cries out for the need of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. After we conclude the Lord's Prayer, we'll take these elements together as community. We do this each week as community, knowing that it was the night before Christ died in which he had gathered with that group of people which had become his community. And during that time, he took the bread, gave thanks, blessed it and broke it, and told his disciples, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. At the end of the evening, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And by eating this bread and drinking this cup, we proclaim Christ's death, celebrate Christ's resurrection, and await Christ's coming again. Hear us now, Lord, as we offer the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, thank you for your holy word. Blessed are you, 
Lord, for teaching us your way. Father, please help us this week to study and reflect on your way. Please help, please help us to go forth, to listen, to learn, and to share Jesus Christ's love and grace. In his name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing, Take My Life. With God's Holy Spirit as your guide and God's Son, Christ Jesus, as your example, live your life in the ways of one who continues to create all things anew. Peace be with you. Amen.